This is the second part of the introduction to cubical type theory. Last time, we mentioned that we are going to add new paths into the types, but then we ran into the problem that we could not even talk about the concatenation of two paths. We have this problem because, well, a priori, nothing stops us from having a set of paths not closed on the concatenation. One should not assume they can always define the usual path operators on the types. This problem was addressed by the Dutch mathematician Daniel Kahn in a different context, who came up with a condition for a combinatorial structure to behave like a topological space. In particular, it will have enough paths. The French computer scientist Thierry Cocon and many other people then found a way to incorporate it into the design of type theory, which eventually led to cubical type theory. So, how should we impose that condition to make the types complete? In cubical type theory, we are going to force every type to implement additional operators as the witness to Kahn's condition that makes it space-like. It is every type's responsibility to show that it behaves. Concretely, we are going to introduce two operators. The first one is called homogeneous composition. It starts with cubes that miss some faces. These face-missing cubes are called boxes. And this operator tells us how various boxes can be composed. For example, if you have a square missing the top edge, the operator can give you the top from the remaining three. The operator works for any dimensions. For the three-dimensional case, the top face in red is given by the composition from the remaining five faces of the box. The composition is homogeneous because the type is not changing from the bottom to top. It is homogeneous along the vertical dimension. The first step to bring this into type theory is to recognize boxes missing more than one face. In the two-dimensional case, not all the lines need to present. All of the vertical ones may be missing, and the composition operator can still give us the top edge. The same applies to three-dimensional boxes that miss more than just the top face. A crucial restriction is that everything should commute nicely with substitution. For example, if you compose a three-dimensional box and then take the diagonal of the result, it should be judgmentally equal to taking the diagonal of the box and then composing the two-dimensional box in the diagonal. In other words, composition commutes with face maps or any other dimensional substitutions. This requirement is not new in type theory. Any syntax in type theory should commute with substitution. However, such a condition is not part of the classical Kahn condition. One variant of homogeneous composition is to have diagonal faces and to allow composition from top to bottom. You can even start from or end with a diagonal face. We will not use this variant in cubical acta, however. The second operator that we will introduce is the coercion operator. The green square field represents the type where the coercion is happening. The coercion operator can transport an element from the zero end of the square to the other end. Note that this is different from the homogeneous composition of a box with only the bottom face. The type is changing during coercion, but remains the same during homogeneous composition. There are also a few variants of the coercion operator. The first variant 
is to allow more flexible starting and ending locations. You can coerce an element in the opposite direction or choose to start from or end with the diagonal. It is similar to the variant we saw for homogeneous composition. The second variant can freeze some parts of the input during coercion so that the result will agree with the initial elements in those parts. For example, if you add the yellow restriction that freezes the right end, the result will coincide with the inputs on their right end points, judgmentally. We will use this variance in cubical EGDA. There are many other variants of these two operators, but any reasonable choices should generate enough elements to complete the definition of a type. One important lemma that we will use in the future is that you can define heterogeneous composition in terms of these two operators. Heterogeneous composition is similar to homogeneous composition we saw, except that the type can change along the composition direction. There are many variants of cubical type theory, and we are still experimenting with different configurations. This table is a simple summary of the two most developed variants. Within each of them, there are still many choices you can make, and it is unclear which combination is the best. In any case, the first major variant has De Morgan algebra on the interval, and it is a bounded disputed lattice with an involution that satisfies the De Morgan laws. The involution is written as the tilde in Agda. It's more general than the Boolean algebra because the law of the excluded middle might not hold. Intuitively, it does not make sense to assume any point in the interval is either 0 or 1. There are many other points. The homogeneous composition in this variant is the standard one. But the coercion can freeze some parts. This variant is the one we will use in Agda. The second major variant has a much simpler algebra on the interval. We only have 0, 1, dimension variables, and nothing else. However, it supports flexible composition and coercion directions. Both variants have univalence, higher inductive types, and all the features you want. It is unclear which one is better, but we are going to try cubical agita in this course, which implements the first variance of cubical type theory. By the way, if you're wondering why the letter F is in red, it is because I am the co-author of those papers, and I am also a developer of the tool RedTT. All right. The rest of this lecture is to learn the syntax of the new operators. I will follow the actor style so that you will not be surprised on Thursday. Let's start with the homogeneous composition. We fix the dimensions i, j, and k as shown on the screen. We will go through the components one by one. The first thing is the type A where the composition is happening. The next thing is an element serving as the bottom of the box. Now it's becoming exciting. We need a way to describe the three walls standing at different locations. The insight is that each location can be represented by a dimensional equation. For example, the back wall is at the location where i equals to 1. Inspired by this, we can write down these walls as a mapping from equations to elements. We call these mappings from equations to elements as systems or partial elements because they specify the elements for some parts of the type. And the syntax of homogeneous composition is just an operator followed by all the parameters. 
The superscript k is the composition dimension. The beginning letter h stands for homogeneous and comp stands for composition. The letter h is actually a terrible choice. The word heterogeneous also begins with h, and there's no way to tell whether h stands for homogeneous or heterogeneous. Anyway, in cubical type theory, the letter h always means homogeneous, and you will never see an h if the composition is heterogeneous. We also need to write down the well typedness of the system. Each part of the system should be well typed and agree with adjacent faces. That is, the faces should be judgmentally equal at their intersections. These three judgments say precisely that. We extend the syntax so that you can put equations into the context to narrow the domain of discussion. And you may append constraints to a judgment to further restrict the elements. We will explain these extensions later. For now, let's also check the syntax of heterogeneous composition. It is similar to the one we saw, except that the type can depend on the dimension k. Alright, let's turn our attention to coercion. The first thing, again, is the type A where the coercion is happening. This type can depend on the coercion dimension j. Next, we want to say the starting element is well typed. It should be an element of the zero end of the type. Finally, we want to make sure the freeze makes sense. The type should stay put at the locations where a freeze is applied. The judgmental equality means that in those parts, type A is equal to its zero endpoint. Now we can put together all the parameters and write down the coercion. The operator transp stands for transport, followed by the type A and elements in the interval, and the starting element in A. The superscript is the coercion dimension. The expression tilde i represents the equation that i equals to zero, the part where a freeze is in effect. In general, we can use a dimension expression r to represent any constraint. We will see why this is the case soon. There is one remaining concept we need to review before finishing up the formal description of homogeneous composition and coercion the dimensional constraints phi in the context. They enable us to discuss partial elements. These elements are partial because the context is restricted, and they might not make sense without the constraints. The syntax of a constraint phi is as follows. A dimension expression is either 0, 1, a variable i, a meet, a join, or a reversal. They satisfy the law of De Morgan algebras. A constraint phi is a logical expression formed by r equals to 0, r equals to 1, and finite conjunctions and disjunctions. There is a functor from dimension expressions to constraints that sends an expression r to the equation r equals to 1. The reversal flips 0 to 1 and vice versa. The rationale is that a reverse expression equals to 1 only when it equals to 0 without the reversal. One important lemma is that every constraint phi is equivalent to r equals to 1 for some r, which is something unique about this variance of cubical type theory. Um, for example, the constraint i equals to 0 or i equals to 1 can be rephrased as the equation between the join of i and the reversed i and 1. This lemma explains why the coercion operator 
is taking a dimension expression instead of a dimensional constraint. Every constraint can be re represented by an expression. Again, this only works in this variance of cubicle type theory. Let's go back to partial elements. It's common to say that something is well-typed and moreover it agrees with some pre-existing partial elements. We can conveniently abbreviate these two judgments as one judgment followed by the constraint imposed by the partial element. So far, I have explained all the extensions we used to define the composition and coercion. To recap, every type now needs to define its own composition and coercion operators. It gives us enough tasks, and after some hard working, we can define them for all the types we know. Let's view an easy example today and continue the discussion next week. Let's see how the operators work for the unit type. Because the unit type is just a point, nothing interesting can happen. We simply return the same element we start with. This example may look dual, but it gives you some ideas about what we're going to do about other types. In sum, we previously had a crisis of not having enough paths. Our solution is to introduce homogeneous composition and coercion. However, this means we need to review all the types and equip each of them with the new operators. We have done one, but there are many more. See you on Thursday. Bye.